What's worse, scamming your own mom just to buy a new car to flex on social media, or running a Ponzi scheme and scamming money from all the people around you? Let's start with number five, mom's new car. In 2018, Heidi Carruthers bought a shiny new BMW for 42,000 pounds with her mom's help. The problem here is that the role of her mom was played by someone else. The misrepresented mom didn't find out about anything until she was later contacted about the car payments falling behind. Carruthers is a serial offender. Her rap sheet has a whopping 79 previous offenses, 34 of which ended in convictions. The 35-year-old wasn't expected to see much mercy from the court when it all came to light. When the case was addressed in court earlier in 2022, all signs pointed toward Carruthers having the book thrown at her. Then her attorney, Steve Hennessy, brought forth a relevant fact. Carruthers had given birth to a daughter in 2019 and had since turned things around. Carruthers had reportedly shown remorse and embarrassment over the whole thing and supposedly had committed no other offenses since the birth of her daughter. She was also a prior user who had been clean since the pregnancy. Her lawyers claimed to the court that she was committed to remaining clean for her daughter. This argument and Carruthers' own confession and testimony were enough to sway officials. Judge Graham Smith noted that the woman being sentenced in 2022 and the offender from 2018 were, quote, two different people. What was supposed to be a 16-month prison sentence was changed to an 18-month suspended sentence. As part of that agreement, Carruthers was subjected to a 20-day rehab program and a four-month curfew enforced by electronic monitoring. In cases like this, it's reasonable to expect the victim to be upset. This goes double when the victim is the offender's mother, seemingly showcasing poor parenting skills for all the world to see. On the contrary, Carruthers' mom turned up in court to support her daughter. The whole thing ended with poor mom on a credit blacklist and the financing company unable to recover most of the original amount financed. Even so, her mom indicated that she loves and supports her daughter and will stick by her. Number four, ATM investment. Scammers Colin Voke and Amy Ploy Pittman out of Darwin, Australia, racked up about $1.9 million banking on ATMs that didn't exist, with their first victim being Pittman's father. Sources say she stole almost $300,000 from him, and dear old dad had no idea he was being let on. Such a substantial sum should be more than enough to get a legitimate ATM business off the ground. But that was never the plan. They simply told people they had a legit company and asked them to get on board. The pair hooked 17 people. Pittman roped in several victims from the hospital she worked at. She had no problem scamming her co-workers on company time. ATM ownership and the operation of the ATMs aren't all that complicated. There are several companies out there willing to help you start out. According to one of those companies, all you would need to start is a suitable location and about five thousand dollars to buy the machine, get it hooked up, and load it with an initial payload of cash. Pittman and her beau chose to skip this part because it was too complicated for them. You must service the ATMs, repair them, keep them loaded, and so on. These are all things that the pair didn't want to do for their investors. They did at least one semi-honest thing. They shelled out around seven hundred thousand dollars to pay their investors, but the money came from other investors' funds, aka it was a Ponzi scheme. Officials estimated a figure shy of one point nine million dollars as the ultimate take in the scam. This number included the initial $300,000 kick-in from Pittman's dad. Despite everything, he was still willing to throw down $10,000 against his daughter's bail. Even so, the courts ultimately denied bail in the case. The other victims probably didn't feel the same way, and the court suspected the victims they had proof about weren't the only ones taken in. In December of 2018, the couple pled guilty to multiple charges. This netted them each a seven and a half year sentence, four of which were without the possibility of parole. Number three, party money. Hannah Dickinson had the grim task of telling those in her life that she was facing terminal cancer. Our story began in 2012 when Hannah went to her parents asking for cash for life-saving treatment. Not long after, she needed another procedure that would happen in New Zealand. By 2013, Dickinson had stretched her parents paper thin. 
They began turning to friends, neighbors, associates, and anybody else who would lend a hand. Dickinson didn't go around asking on her own. Residents eventually came together to give Dickinson everything she needed. This would be a heartwarming story of a community rallying around one of their own, if it weren't a complete scam. Turns out Hannah's grim <laughs> task was self-imposed and totally unnecessary. She had scammed everybody around her. There was no cancer, and none of the money that people gave to her ended up going to medical treatments. The cancer she claimed to have, it's worth noting, was a rare form that has a high survival rate and is among the easiest to cure. This meant she could claim to be healed and back out of the whole deal whenever she wanted. The whole thing is even more heinous because one of her victims was an actual cancer survivor. Fresh off his own treatment, the generous guy kicked in $10,000 out of the nearly $42,000 that Dickinson made off with in the end. She got found out in 2018 after one of her victims saw a suspicious social media post and contacted the police. Cops put out the word and others came forward in short order. It was later revealed that she had been using the money to party it up with friends at home and abroad. Hard partying and holidays were the name of the game, all made possible by money that was supposed to be paying for life-saving medical treatments. Naturally, her travels included some serious drinking and use of illegal substances, both of which were a constant in her brief new life. This ended up playing into her case later on. When her entire fake story shattered in 2018, Dickinson landed in court. Officials saddled her with seven charges of obtaining property by deception. Despite just how brazen her crimes were, one person saw good in her still, her lawyer, Beverly Lindsay. The defense brought up the case of a health blogger, Belle Gibson, who was ultimately saddled with a $400,000 fine for misleading her readers and scamming whatever she could get out of her audience. This was all done under the guise of putting out content to help others in similar situations, which Lindsay argued made Gibson's case worse. She pleaded with the magistrate not to send Dickinson to jail. The magistrate saw things differently. Court official David Starvaghi argued that Dickinson's in-your-face fraud to her own parents, no less, required swift and decisive deterrence. As such, he threw Dickinson in jail for three months. She also caught a 12-month community service order that amounted to 150 hours along with court-mandated rehab. This resulted in the scammer losing her job at Little Real Estate as a property manager. At the same time frame as the original scam, it turns out that Dickinson was engaging in a much more conventional fraud. Records show she attempted to get a car loan for $30,000 using fake documents and a fake identity. As if that wasn't enough, she nabbed over $100,000 in disability payments using fake documents submitted to the local magistrate's office. The whole thing came out in 2021, and Dickinson found herself in court again. Officials were much less lenient this time. They slapped her with a sentence of at least a year for using false documentation with more charges pending as of 2022. The car loan was reportedly not granted, making it a bit less serious. The disability payments, however, went on from 2014 to 2018 when her original case broke. Number two, cancer banker. Rajesh Gedia of Berkshire pocketed around 1.8 million pounds from multiple scams, including defrauding insurance and pension companies with claims of a cancer diagnosis. The scams ran from 2016 onward and included a claim that he had been promoted to vice president at his employer, Bank of America. Gedia claimed to have aggressive pancreatic cancer, giving him a year to live. The scam perpetrated on his pension and life insurance companies allowed him to withdraw funds he otherwise would have had to wait quite some time for all at once. About 1.2 a million pounds of his total take came from this avenue. Along the way, Gedia had an unnamed accomplice pose as a doctor to vouch for him, and he dragged many unknowing doctors' names into the case. The other half of the story is that he claimed to be the vice president of Bank of America. He used this position to convince victims to invest in banking products and services that did not exist. Two of those victims were his cousin and his own father. Things initially came to a head with a documentation issue found in 2019. Still, he continued scamming with a new insurance company buying and cash a policy worth 900,000 pounds. According to officials, Getty has spent the cash on a mansion in the expensive Virginia water area of Surrey. He also got his hands on some expensive vehicle. To put the cherry on top, he sent his children to an expensive private school in the area. Whether his primary motivation was selfish greed or providing a better life for his children, he still sentenced seven souls to financial ruin. Falsely representing both Bank of America and Goldman Sachs, Getty has scammed 600,000 pounds from seven different victims. His cousin, Vipul Chandegra, was out 63,000 pounds. Some 100 
116,000 pounds left the pockets of Per Selbeck, a local dad whose kids went to the same school as Gedius. At a party, he met Wayne Johncock, who lost out on 181,000 pounds. Perhaps the most tragic victims were Gedius' regular taxi driver and the man's wife, Saida Ahmed. The pair lost over 100,000 pounds of the scam. Part of it was taxes attached to the investment, which the couple borrowed around 70,000 pounds to pay. This resulted in them losing their home. What makes this part of the story sting even worse is that he faked the death of his own daughter to get out of owning up. When Saida confronted him the first time, he concocted a car accident in the state that had his daughter hospitalized, drawing his attention from the matter at hand. When she confronted him again, he shrugged her off by saying his daughter had succumbed to her injuries. When the law finally caught up with Gedia in 2022, he was saddled with 30 fraud charges. The court showed him no mercy, and he ultimately pled guilty to 22 of those charges. Judge Deborah Taylor sympathized with the victims and painted a picture of Gedia as a man with no morals. Detective Constable Daniel Weller of London's Insurance Fraud Enforcement, Judge Taylor sentenced Gedia to a grand total of six years and nine months in prison. Authorities went to work getting victims their money back, liquidating Gedia's ill-gotten assets. Number 1. Ponzi Pharmacist Natalie Cochran, 40, a pharmacist from Raleigh County, West Virginia, ran a scam that ultimately cost her victims a hefty $2 million. She used two companies that she owned with her husband to run an elaborate Ponzi scheme 2017 to 2019, defrauding individuals, companies, and even banks along the way. The scam centered around investments in her two companies, Technology Management Solutions and Tactical Solutions Group. The two fake companies were misrepresented to 11 people, among other victims. The investors were convinced by fake government contracts and other files produced by Cochran. She sold them on the experience, contracts, and projects her company never had. To keep the scam going, Cochran used some of the money to pay back old investors as new ones jumped on board. The classic Ponzi scheme was peppered by personal and business expenditures, some over $10,000 each. None of them pertain to any of the contracts or investments that Cochran represented. However, she used $35,000 of the money to buy a sweet 1965 Shelby Cobra, a collector's item that could be argued as an investment. The United States isn't the best place to run a Ponzi scheme, as Cochran found out in 2020. The investigation involved multiple agencies and local and federal government branches, including Secret Service. High-stakes crimes were finally brought to light in September 2020, when Cochran pled guilty to charges involving money laundering and wire fraud. Her sentence was 11 years in prison and three years of supervised release. Along with jail time, Cochran has to pay back over $2.5 million to her victim. So far, asset forfeitures have barely scratched the surface. The seizure of her personal and company bank accounts only yielded $45,000. Most scam stories end when the perpetrator gets their day in court. In this case, however, things only get weirder and darker. Cochran was suspected of going after her own husband. Michael Cochran fell ill while all this was happening and reportedly died in hospice care in February. The late Michael was only 38, making natural causes a suspicious conclusion. Local investigators were struck by this fact and decided to look deeper into it. After all, if Natalie killed her co-owner husband, she would no longer have to split the loot. Additionally, that would be one less loose end. Michael's body was exhumed and an autopsy was performed. The investigation is ongoing as of 2022, leaving authorities tight-lipped on the matter. What's known is that Natalie was brought back into court in 2022, indicted for her husband's passing, and faced first-degree charges. With a not-guilty plea and the trial date still pending, this is anybody's guess as to what will happen before it's all over. Click to watch one of these next videos, and let us know in the comments section who's worse, any scammer on this list or any famous prosperity preacher.